Hello, my name is Stella Cunningham, and today I'm going to be talking about beauty standards and the impact they present on women's issues both locally and globally. Beauty standards don't exist as one alienated set of ideas that can be copied and pasted into every culture around the world. There is a very interesting article called Beauty Through History from the Washington Post where Sharam Ram speaks on how perfection and beauty are subjective making what actually constitutes beauty in any given era very complex. What is considered beautiful is often influenced by what is going on in a given society. They know how in pre-World War I times, full faces and voluptuous bodies were often favored traits in America, as they were associated with good health and beauty. Though one look at modern magazines and stars currently can show the changes incurred since then. Today, you're more likely to find a very toned and thin woman being described as healthy than a big-bodied woman. I find it particularly interesting that though this article was written in 1987, it still reflects what stands true today and emphasizes how timeless and constant change in the beauty standard is. What causes these changes, and what decides the features that remain ideal for decades while others fall to the past? The thin heroin chic body ideal of the 90s certainly doesn't look like the most popular female icons of today, like Kim Kardashian or Nicki Minaj, yet the idea of remaining hairless via shaving and stockings has remained the standard since the late 1800s. Perhaps the answer lies in the lesser considered power of association. While women's body hair is both sanitary, normal, and healthy, why is it that it has taken a negative association with uncleanliness and masculinity? Nadina Jaka, an author for The Atlantic, reports that the first notes of this emerged in Darwin's 1871 book, Descent of Man, where it was claimed that body hair, in association with race, indicated primitive ancestry and a return to less developed forms. The scientists behind these theories also surmised that while the hair on men was supposed to be there, this was not the case for women. With this misinformation finding the American public, Hairiness in women soon became indicative of deviance. Researchers rushed to prove these theories correct and came up with an 1893 study of 271 cases of insanity in white women that claimed insane women had more facial hair than the sane and that it was also thicker and stiffer, more closely resembling that of what they called inferior races. Today, one might claim that being hair-free is entirely aesthetics-based or just reflects good hygiene, but a look into the past can give clear evidence that hairlessness was adopted out of a fear of being associated with criminal violence, strong sexual instincts, and animalistic behavior, all of which were often racistly attributed to people of color in the U.S. at the time. Perhaps hairlessness in women changed and remained the standard for such a long time due to the downward association with negative qualities, as opposed to women's body types, which were always defined by different versions of an ideal. It seems that the difference between the emergence of a new beauty goal compared to a new beauty detriment dictates whether they stay or go in the eyes of the public. In the article, The Beauty Ideal, The Effects of European Standards of Beauty on Black Women, a woman named Suzanne L. Bryant suggests that oppressive beauty ideals are ingrained into the institutional racism and sexism of American culture, which makes for an excellent point on how beauty standards are often followed blindly without an understanding of the foundations they were built upon and the dark history they may stem from. While racist ideals of the past still affect us today, they are not the only element influencing the internalization of widespread and unrealistic beauty ideals. As stated by Adora Ahmed, an author of The Daily Star, beauty standards are not set according to a certain individual's personal taste. They reflect trends visible in mainstream media, slowly setting an ideal within the mind of the audience. Alibi Kolmogorova, an author in the International Journal of Culture and Mental Health, mentions that beauty standards, which are often unrealistic and a danger to health, are to a significant degree due to widespread advertising and communication of said standards to the public. Naturally, the people living with higher rates of media exposure tend to be affected the most, primarily young women ages 12 to 25. In fact, the majority of our population living in cities are more prone to have developed a high level of dissatisfaction with one's own appearance and a highly critical attitude towards others. 
This is assumed by Colmo Garova and their colleagues to be due to the omnipresent nature of advertising and subliminal messaging seen in metropolitan areas. Moreover, the fear of judgment from others within a community only continues to perpetuate a sense of urgency and need to fit into an imaginary box where you would not only be free of judgment, but perhaps even evoke respect or envy from your peers. Kolmogorova speaks on how negative character associations with appearances aren't the only ones to exist, and that people exposed to heavy media influence often express the idea that being attractive is not just fashionable, but essential, because they have grown to think that youth and beauty are so strongly associated with success in life and with well-being that you cannot have one without the other. In the article, The Good, the Bad, and the Beautiful, the authors Temple Northup and Carol Liebler talk about the difference between body image and beauty ideals, with body image being your perception of self and beauty ideals representing the ideal version of self. They argue that the broader the difference between your actual self and the idealized version of yourself, the more likely you are to feel depressed and anxious, which can lead to eating disorders and other negative behaviors. Unrealistic portrayals of beauty ideals and norms in media have been shown to enhance the rift between one's body image and beauty ideal. Unrealistic beauty standards can be seen in Barbie dolls, advertising, social media, and film, making children as young as seven begin dieting and others as young as preschool age expressing a desire to be thin. According to social comparison theory, humans have an innate tendency to compare themselves to others, especially among youth finding their place in the world. What is seen as a result is known as downward versus upward comparison. Upward comparison is when an individual compares themselves to someone they deem to be better than them in some respect, often resulting in a depressed state. Opposingly, downward comparison represents the opposite, where an individual compares themselves to someone that they consider worse in some way. Interestingly, this usually leads to a happier state. As a result, there seems to be this cycle where one feels inadequate in comparison to the unrealistic people in media and finds ways to emulate them, even when risks are involved like plastic surgery or extreme dieting. From here, it becomes easy to develop a sense of narcissism and a critical outlook towards others who haven't put in the same level of effort to be the ideal, leading to more instances of downward comparison. The popularization of unrealistic and Eurocentric ideals across the world has had detrimental effects upon the self-esteem of women. In the book A Body Beautiful by Rachel Calgaro and contributors, it is said that according to a recent survey of 3,300 girls and women across 10 countries, 90% of all women aged 15 to 64 worldwide want to change at least one aspect of their physical appearance with body weight ranking the highest. As a result, 67% of these women reported that they actually withdraw from life-engaging, life-sustaining activities due to feeling badly about their looks. Things like giving an opinion, meeting friends, exercising, going to work or school, dating, and even going to the doctor are impeded. Calgaro surmises from this that body dissatisfaction is normative in the experiences of girls and women. These insecurities lead to upcroppings of harmful trends like pro-anorexia websites and thinspiration content. If these unrealistic beauty standards are having such a negative effect on the mental health of women, why is it that it's still so represented? Who benefits from this? Looking at certain statistics, there's at least one clear beneficiary when it comes to the body dissatisfaction of women, the beauty industry. According to an article called 24 Powerful Cosmetics Industry Statistics by Chris Colmar, the U.S. alone is worth $84 billion in the beauty and personal care market. That is 22% of the global market, generating more money than any other country by about $20 billion. They take advantage of women who feel insecure in their image due to things like their own advertisements and then offer the idea of a solution, beauty in a bottle. Additionally, 66% of buyers discover brands via social media. Now, makeup and cosmetics can be an artistic outlet, and I would never suggest that all those who use it are insecure or looking to beautify themselves for others. It runs deeper than that, and many use makeup to instill confidence in themselves and partake in the art of makeup. 
The issue lies in where the line is drawn between doing something for confidence or fun and doing something because others have convinced you it's required to feel okay in your skin. But in the face of countless unrealistic and altered women being shown as the beauty standard via social media and advertising, how does one protect themselves from the negative effects of constant upward comparison, feeling that compared to these people on the screen with hundreds of positive comments, you aren't enough? There's recently been heavy research into this topic. In the article, Protective Filtering, a qualitative study on the cognitive strategies young women use to promote body positive image in the face of beauty ideal imagery on Instagram, the author Ornella Evans and her associates note that by actively criticizing and interpreting media with the intention of preserving personal body positive image, women reported fewer instances of body dissatisfaction when exposed to media imagery, specifically in the cases of thin ideal content. Protective filtering is the act of consciously analyzing the content seen online with the intention of protecting your own body positivity. Reminding yourself that many images aren't real and only represent what is wanted to be seen is an example. Other examples include actively expressing gratitude for your body when exposed to content online and focusing on changeable elements of online women like clothes or aesthetic rather than their body. Beauty standards have been around for thousands of years and likely will far into the future, but it is important to remember, as Alex Keeler says in the article, this is where beauty standards actually come from, ideal beauty has consistently represented the most unattainable option in a given society. So next time you're feeling insecure or find yourself making upward comparisons, I suggest taking a moment to consciously analyze why you find certain things to be the ideal especially if it represents a double standard with the opposite sex, such as body hair acceptance, or is met with an I just feel that way statement without any cohesive reason behind it. Consider what thoughts are your own and what thoughts may have been introduced to you subtly over the course of time. Are you attributing more to beauty than appearance, such as characteristics, and if so, why? There is no one true beauty standard, so be careful when adopting ideas of physical perfectionism. You will never find a perfect body that everyone can agree is the best, so don't beat yourself up for not meeting it. There is still so much to be done and learned when it comes to the beauty standards and the effects. How do you think beauty should be seen and shown? Do you think the way advertising has evolved is a threat to women's well-being? If so, what should we do about it? I'll leave these questions for you to consider and debate among yourselves. If you're searching for ways to learn more, I highly suggest the articles included in today's episode, which I'll link down below. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Bye.